Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we're going to talk about YouTube temporarily killing the custom thumbnail. We're going to talk about new ways to get grant funding for your video content and a whole lot more. So go ahead and stick around. Cowabunga, dude. How you doing? Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 125 of the BSP. My name is Bander. This is what I says down below. Timestamps of everything that I talk about so you can skip around and save a couple of minutes. But if you got the time, I'd suggest listening to the entire episode. Couple of personal things up top. First up, you will notice I am uploading this video version of the podcast to the Podcasted YouTube channel. And before everybody jumps down my throat and gets super angry, just know this is a test. The, the review videos are not going anywhere. I am just uploading this to see if anybody on the Podcasted channel finds it interesting, gets any value of out of it or wants this to continue to be uploaded here. So let me know in the comments down below if you like this or if you hate it, or if it should just go back and be only on the Geeks Rising channel, let me know. And if you are a more traditional podcast listener and you wanna to listen to just the audio version, go ahead and head over to bandrewsays.com and that will have links to everything you need to download it to your podcatcher, all that stuff. Next, let's talk about subtle improvements to your podcast. So I always mention how making subtle improvements to the audio quality or the content quality of your podcast is a great way to increase your confidence in sharing your podcast. And something I noticed last week was how frequently I pick up and replace the mouse on the desk and how annoying that was. Now, I was going to go ahead and try to use my iPad for my notes, but I realized, oh, looking down like this really doesn't work for me. So I realized, you know what, I have a trackpad. I'll go ahead and use the trackpad and therefore I'm not going to be picking up and putting down the mouse constantly adding that little bump to the background. And that's just a subtle improvement that I am making to hopefully improve the audio quality and make it more bearable for me during the editing process and re-listening process. And the last personal thing is I want to briefly talk about all the different videos that I put out this last week. Obviously, I did the review on Tuesday. That always happens. But on Friday, I released the Ultimate Travel Podcast Setup, which was a new type of video that I did. And it was a lot of fun for me to make. And I hope it was fun to watch. Very different out of the blue. So if you want to check that out, that is on the Podcastage channel. On Friday, I also released a new metal video song that I do. I, I don't know if anybody knows or or many people know, but I do play guitar and, and I record some songs very rarely and I put them on youtube.com slash play. So if you are interested in that, you could go ahead and head over there or you can just search must love karate. That is, <laughs> it's such a dumb name. I love it. It, it. It's my non-existent made up metal band, must love karate. Go ahead and check that out. Then on Saturday, I did two live streams. I streamed for three hours on twitch.tv slash podcast playing Alan Wake. And again, I, I got the pants scared off of me. That thing is terrifying. And I, I hate it so much that I love it. It scares me so much that I love the game and it's a lot of fun to play. And then I did an hour long stream on the podcast channel talking about the plans for this channel, what's changing in terms of the release schedule, all sorts of stuff like that. And then I re-uploaded the video on the main channel without the Q&A because I didn't want people to see an hour and 15 minute long video and say, Ugh, you know what, I'm going to avoid watching that. I wanted it to be somewhat digestible. But if you do want the Q&A, I did upload the full unedited version except for the three minutes at the beginning where my voice was all funny. I uploaded I uploaded it to the Podcastage 2 channel. So let's get into the YouTube news. The first thing is not big news at all. It's there is now a desktop mini player available. So when I was watching YouTube this last week, I noticed that while I was watching it, if I clicked the home button, the video didn't stop playing. Now it was just minimized into a box in the bottom right hand side of the browser and it continued to play, which personally I love. I love this feature and that's what I really like about watching YouTube on my iPad because it minimizes the video into a square or a rectangle, I should say, on the bottom. It continues to play. You can search for new stuff. On the iPhone, it's a little worse because it minimizes it to a tiny bar that's unviewable. So I don't like that as much. But now on your desktop browser, I don't know if it's strictly for Chrome or not, but that is available and I'm a big fan of that. I shared this with some people in the Discord voice chat and they said, oh my God, this sounds terrible. I hate it so much. 
Well, if you do hate it, don't worry. The first time it shows up, it will have a little pop-up saying, hey, do you want this? And it's really easy to disable it. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Small, small improvements making a much better experience for you. Now, the big heap of news that, that came out this last week, YouTube stopped showing custom thumbnails to 0.3% of viewers. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that turns out to be millions of users. It, it could have a big impact. And that really is pretty much the entire news story. Someone tweeted at YouTube saying, why am I not seeing custom thumbnails? And they responded stating that they were running an experiment on 0.3% of viewers where they show automatically generated thumbnails to improve the automatic generated thumbnails. Now, I understand why people are mad, why they're pissed off, and why they're screaming at YouTube. And it's because people put a lot of thought, a lot of time, and a lot of sometimes money into getting custom thumbnails made because that is a huge reason why somebody will click on your video. So the fact that it just disappeared for 0.3% of, of viewers on YouTube, is it's alarming. But for me personally, I don't care. The reason I don't care is this means that automatically generated thumbnails in the future will be better. That's why they are running this. They want to make sure that they get as many clicks on a video as possible. And as smaller creators, I think therein lies a huge possible benefit. A lot of smaller creators don't spend time making custom thumbnails. A lot of smaller creators just upload and say, okay, there it is. This will help them. This will help the, the millions of videos, I'm sure, that are uploaded without, without the custom thumbnail so people can actually see, oh, well, that looks interesting. Let's go ahead and click on that rather than just, oh, that's a black screen because they dropped their camera for a second. So I think all around this is a good thing and I am not that upset about it, but I do understand why people are upset. And I will go ahead and link the Google product form where they announced this in the show notes if you want to read people's responses there. Now this one, this piece of news is the most interesting to me, and it's called the VidCon Grant. So VidCon announced that they will have a new grant program where every single week they find a new video creator and provide a $2,000 grant that you as the creator can spend any way that you want. Now they made clear to point out that this is not directly associated with the convention that they run, VidCon, but it is a standalone thing. You're not, if you get awarded this grant, you're not going to get special access or special treatment at the convention. Completely separate. So they did announce what requirements there are. And the first thing is you need to be a video content creator that hosts their content on YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Twitch, Musical.ly, Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, or your own personal blog. But it does have to be video content then you need to be uploading two videos, at least two videos per month over the last six months prior to your application date. So you can't just say, oh, I'm a creator. I want to I want to apply for this grant. You need to have six months of videos where you uploaded at least two times per month. Your videos need to earn less than 150,000 views per video and you must live in the US, which sucks for anybody outside the US. That's a huge bummer because this could be a huge thing for smaller creators outside the US. So kind of a bummer there, but all around, I am really happy about this. And, and quick side note, I will go ahead and link the application webpage in the show notes and description down below. I will point out that at the time of recording this, the entire website was down though. So I don't know if it's going back up. I don't know if they changed their mind, but the, the articles I read were pointing this out and I will link that to you. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say, good for VidCon, or I should say good for Hank Green. I think this is incredible that he is supporting or this company is supporting the smaller creators because $2,000 is a lot of money. And when you're grinding and grinding and grinding and seeing slow growth, it can be very disheartening. So this $2,000 grant, could be that motivating factor to get you to say, oh, I can take this a lot more seriously and improve your content, get better and more consistent with your content and, and grow. And then additionally, $2,000, that could help you upgrade and improve the quality of your content quite significantly because video gear can get to be pretty dang expensive. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. If anybody out there meets the requirements, I urge you to apply for this. That's incredible that you have the chance to just get handed $2,000 that you can spend any way you want. You can say, oh, well, you know what? I'm th That covers rent for two months. 
I'm going to go ahead and quit my crappy Walmart greeter job. No offense, Walmart, or if anybody who works in the greeter position, but I can go ahead and quit and take this this YouTube or this video creation thing seriously for two months and see how that would be. All around amazing thing there. Next, this is not necessarily YouTube related, but it is YouTube adjacent. It's changes to the Twitch stream discovery. So Twitch announced that they will be making changes to stream discovery, and they will be doing this by improving the homepage with more recommended streams based on viewing habits. Wonderful. One thing I've never heard anybody complain about is algorithm-based video showing or, or content showing uh, timelines and any of that stuff. People don't hate that at all. Wonderful. I'm sure it will be great, though. No offense, Twitch. Very, very, very much enjoying streaming on your platform. <laughs> and then also, Twitch is going to be changing their channel pages or redesigning their channel pages to help people find videos that are their, I'm guessing, VODs, and then also help them find the follow and subscribe buttons. Now, something that I think is really cool that they did here is they launched a roadmap that shows the status of the changes to allow people to go ahead and make adjustments if they think it's necessary. And since YouTube is already stealing a bunch of ideas from Twitch, hmm, YouTube, maybe you should steal this roadmap idea. And I'll go ahead and link the roadmap in the show notes and description if you want to check that out. But all around, I think it's interesting. I'm new to Twitch. I'm having fun there. And I think it's fun to jump in to a, a platform that's been out there for quite some time and then see all the the anger and the outrage going on there or, or see the changes that they make to try to improve it. Now let's jump to some security news. And there is a bunch of it. The first piece of news comes from Have I Been Pwned, Firefox, and 1Password. And they are making it easier to know if your login information has been leaked previously. So First, what is Have I Been Pwned? It's a website that you can enter your email address into and it will tell you if any of your accounts that you've created using that email have been exposed in a data leak. So first, let's talk about Firefox. They're launching something called Firefox Monitor. And essentially, I think this is just a search feature in the browser that allows you to search the Have I Been Pwned database so essentially, you could just put in your email. My, my email is blah, blah, blah at YouTube.com. Is that, is that even a domain? I don't know if you can even have that domain. And then it'll show you if you've been leaked. The more interesting one is 1Password. And in Watchtower, which is a feature in 1Password, they've allowed you to determine if you've had any of your information leaked, but they just rolled out Have I Been Pwned integration. And this, this gets really cool. I'm really excited about this. So they do this without have I been pwned, knowing what email address that you're even looking for. The way that they're accomplishing this is by hashing the email address that you're searching for uh, using SHA1. I don't know what that is. I, I, I'm not, no security expert. And then they search one or, or one password searches have I been pwned using the first six characters of the hashed email address. So they get back a large number of results. They're getting back X number of results. And then one password on their end is, is I guess, uh, pairing that down to the final email using the rest of the hashed email address. So Have It Been Pwned has no idea what you're looking for. They just know the first six characters of that hashed email. So they, they have no idea. Just a really nice way, an interesting way to keep it a little bit more secure and not know who's trying to determine if they've been hacked. Now, one downside, if I am understanding the blog post that Agile Bits put out, side note, Agile Bits is the owner or the creator of 1Password, and it's that they will only allow you to search the email address you use to set up your 1Password account. So that is the downside there, but all around, I think I'm very happy to see this. I don't personally use Firefox because it doesn't allow for physical two-factor authentication tokens, but good for Firefox and very good for 1Password. Excited to see that. This next thing is even better news for me, and it's that Twitter is going to allow for USB token two-factor authentication logins. Yes, 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 Twitter, yes! I have been waiting for this for so long. A couple of months ago, or maybe a year ago, they rolled out the ability to use a, like an OTP generator, one of those six uh, character generators like uh, Google Authenticator or Authy. But now they're launching physical two-factor authentication tokens. So if you got a YubiKey, you can plug that in and log in without having to pull out your phone or your Apple Watch or anything like that. Awesome to see Twitter 
Thank you for making security improvements and making it better. So if somebody tries to hack into my account, if they have the username and the password, they still can't do it. Appreciate you. Next, this one, ooh, boy, this is a rough one. So let's talk about this. A U.S. contractor planned to sell data surveillance tools to governments. The contractor is Sir Kinnis. Sir Sinis, I don't know how to pronounce it. And the tools that they were trying to sell used Facebook, Twitter, and other open social media platforms to find political dissidents. That doesn't sound concerning at all, does it? The company provided pitches to governments like Tunisia, the United Arab Emirates, Cyprus, and unknown others. And they stated that they would actively hide that the government is using this tool. Hmm. You know where we got to go. Let's go to the conspiracy corner real quick. God, I have said this so many times to people. Hey, be careful what you're saying. Otherwise, you're going to end up on a list. And every single time people say, oh, shut up. You're just being paranoid. That doesn't happen. You're just living in la la land. You've been watching X-Files too much. You're just paranoid. Oh, am I? Am I paranoid? It's not paranoia if it's really happening, you dopes. It's not. Let this act as a reminder to everybody watching this or everybody who's told me, oh, you're being paranoid. Everything you say on a social media site can be seen and will likely be used against you, if at all possible. So please don't be an idiot and be careful what you say. And you know what? I wasn't being paranoid. It was actually happening. So shut up. Let's get out of the conspiracy corner. I'm getting heated. So on the note of being a complete idiot on the internet, a man who threatened Ajit Pai was tracked down by the FBI. This complete dickhead, or as the Kiwis would say, this dickhead. I love how they say that, this dickhead. <laughs> he was from LA. He threatened to harm Ajit Pai's family. He sent three emails, including the schools where Ajit Pai's kids went to, I believe, as well as a photograph of Ajit Pai and his family. So when questioned by the FBI, the guy who was arrested said that he sent the emails because of the FCC's repeal to net neutrality. Do I need to point out that you shouldn't be threatening people with violence because they say something or they enact a policy that you're not a big fan of? Let, let, let me go ahead and give everybody who's watching or listening this a note. If you're a big enough scumbag to threaten somebody with violence over a policy you don't like, I hate you and you are not welcome here. Go ahead and click off this video. Never watch this channel again. You're not welcome here. I don't want you here. You, you shouldn't be threatening people with violence because you don't like what they're doing. And like I said, you will be put on a list if you don't if you say something that that, that is directly violate or not violating but uh, threatening somebody high in government power. You freaking dope! How do you think that's not gonna come back and bite you in the butt? What a bunch of idiots! Don't threaten people online. You can't really truly be anonymous on the internet. It will come back to you. I've been threatened on, on YouTube, and guess what? It wasn't that hard to find out who did it. I know where you're from, Mr. Poland, you freaking dope. Come on, man. I'm a dope, and I can find out where you're from. Knock it off, and don't do that kind of stuff. This next piece of security news is even better. Another leak of 340 million records occurred. Now... I think leak is a little bit of a strong word. So let me go ahead and explain what happened. This time, the leak came from a data aggregator by the name of Exactus, and a security researcher named Vinny Troya discovered that the data bank did not have a firewall and was completely exposed. The information that was leaked or available, I should say, included personal interests, home addresses, emails, religious beliefs, smoking status, phone numbers, and information about your children. The article I read about this came from Engadget. They reached out to Exactus. They got nothing in return. They were just hiding out. They're just like, no, we're, we're just going to ignore it because they know people don't seem to care when all this sensitive information gets leaked. People don't care. Why not? I'm personally so sick of all these companies collecting our information without our knowledge and not taking proper security procedures. How is that even legal? How is this possible? So I was recently listening to, to the latest episode of the Complete Privacy and Security Podcast, and I'm going to share this little anecdote with you to show you how scary this can be. Although maybe you're one of those people who says, oh, it doesn't matter. 
I'm not, I don't have anything to hide. No big deal. So they went to Best Buy and they are very, very conscious and very deliberate about what information about them is available online or, or even in the public arena. And they made the mistake of using their credit card at Best Buy. And what they saw on the cashier screen was a bunch of their historical information, their name, their addresses, their email addresses, their phone numbers. And it showed up. It populated. They'd never signed up for one of those savey save cards. Hey, we, we want to earn less money. One of those cards, it, it was just populated from some data aggregator or data broker that bought that information and stores it in Best Buy's database and looks up, oh, this is the person using their credit card. Let's go ahead and pull that information and show them what's there. And then if they ever sign up for a card, we'll know if they're lying. We'll know everything about them. And then we can market to them by sending them snail mail, junking up that and, and spamming their email address. So that's scary. But on a good note, let's let's end the security thing on a good note. California passed a new Consumer Privacy Act. This new law will go into effect in 2020, I believe it was, and it's going to require companies that store personal information to disclose the types of data that they collect, as well as allow consumers to opt out of having their data sold. Oh my God. I want this so bad. I want this so bad. I want to be able to say, do not sell my data to anybody. And you know what? You had a couple of really awesome companies like AT&T and Amazon putting millions of dollars into trying to get this to not pass. Millions of dollars. So we know what Amazon and AT&T are up to. They desperately want to sell your information. So I'm just curious what all of you think. You're going to need to leave a comment down below for me because I desperately want to know. At what point was us giving companies our money not enough? What point did that change? And do you think it's purely greed that led them to thinking, okay, well, thanks for the money, but you know what? We're going to go ahead and exploit your sensitive information and sell that off too so we can get a, a few more little bucks, little buckaroos. Was it that? Or do you think it's, it's these companies being misguided and thinking, oh, well, you know what? Selling this information to this person or this company will ultimately end up giving the end user a better experience. What do you think there? I want to hear from you guys because I am at a loss for words. I'm so sick and tired of this and good on California's government for passing this and actually caring about their consumers' privacy. Good for them. Let's briefly talk about new products. There's one thing I want to talk about and it's the BlackBerry Key 2. This thing's going to cost 650 bucks and it's going to be available July 18th. And I, I, I'll admit, I know it's dumb, but I am totally caught up in the hype around this new phone. And the reason, I was a BlackBerry user for many years. I don't even know what models these are, but I rode these things hard. I rode these things dirty and I put them away wet until they died. I loved these phones so dang much. I even considered picking up the BlackBerry Classic a couple of weeks ago because I longed to have a physical keyboard again. Now, the screen size on the Key 2 will be quite a bit smaller than something like the iPhone 10 or the, the upcoming iPhone 10 Pro Plus, whatever the hell they're going to be calling it. But I think that could be get that you could get used to that and you would have to reacclimate to the keyboard. But I think BlackBerry is finally coming back into its own and not trying to emulate all the other smartphones. They know what they're, they do well and they're trying to implement that into their new devices. So they know BlackBerry can do security well. So they're going to be one of the more secure Android devices out there. And then they know that they can do keyboards well. And this is using the most popular keyboard from previous BlackBerry models. And it's 20% bigger than the Key 1. So, oh my God, I am so tempted to pick this up because I loved these phones so much. This is what I used for years before I switched to the 4S. Although the one thing keeping me from possibly doing that, the Purism, what is it? The Purism Librem 5 which is a Linux-based phone, is scheduled to come out January 2019. I don't know. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave a couple links in the description down below to the Purism Librem 5 because that is the, the, the smartphone I'm most excited about. And then I'll also link a gadgethacks.com blog article that shows the foremost privacy and security phones out there and the key to was the first one. So I'll go ahead and link those in the show notes. Briefly, what I've been testing, 
Acusonus plugins. So on this episode, I'll be testing out the Acusonus DSer, the Era D, which has a D verb and a D noise, and possibly the D plosive. I, I just want to test them out, see how they sound. Full disclosure, I did receive the uh, the licenses from the company to do a review, which I will be doing in a, about a month or so. I'm just testing these out, getting a good feel for them before I do that. So I want to hear from you guys down below. Do you any of those things? The D verb, the D noise, or the D plosive, or the D esser? Is it very apparent? Is it transparent? Does it sound good? Does it sound bad? I want to know what you think of the audio on this quality or on this episode. Let me know. Now let's jump to what you had to say. First thing comes from Up All Night, a return character on this segment. He says, the downside of putting all your alternative funding streams on YouTube is if they decide to change the rules and you get cut off, which is a real possibility with YouTube. All your eggs are already in one basket on YouTube. If it goes away, your alternative funding streams are done no matter what they are. So I'm a little bit confused about what you're trying to say here. It sounds like you're saying even if you have alternative funding streams on third-party services, those disappear along with YouTube. And I get what you're trying to say, but I disagree with you because it wouldn't disappear if you have your own hub to have everything on. If you have your own domain, your own website where you host all your content as well. So for me personally, I upload my reviews, my podcasts, everything to geeksrising.com. So if YouTube disappeared, it would be nightmarish, but I could re-upload all my videos to some other platform and then re-embed those new videos on my website in every single review. And that would be a good jumping off point. It's a good place or a good practice to have your own domain where you host your own stuff and that way if one of these platforms disappears that you really really rely on you have the ability to say oh well you know what it sucks it's going to be a little bit of work but it's already in place I don't have to write 350 articles to get re-caught up so that's just a really important reason why you need to have your own domain in case the platform disappears. The second comment comes from Anthony C. He says, there is a big personality in the archery community that switched all of his videos to Instagram a while ago. He got so much heat for it from the viewers, including myself. The vertical video is garbage. It cut off a large amount of the field he was shooting at, and in some cases, it actually cut off the target he was aiming at due to the angle of the camera. Also at the time, the video was gone in 24 hours after the stream, so the average viewer who has a job, kids, etc., and does not check Instagram on the daily basis would lose any of the lessons or tips he may have shown in the videos. Now he has decided to save all the videos and upload it to YouTube after the stream was over. So I'll go ahead and start by saying this. I think Instagram and IGTV can be a really great compliment for YouTubers, but Like I said last week, I just can't stand people saying, oh, finally, YouTube has some competition. YouTube has some competition in IGTV. No, it doesn't. It's a completely different platform. People will use it completely different. It's a good compliment if you want to go ahead and use a Facebook product like Instagram or Instagram TV, which I will not do. I I used to. I I don't even have it on my phone anymore. I, I hate Instagram. I hate Facebook. And I know this will hurt me ultimately, but... It sounds like this archery guy just was doing the exact wrong thing. Either he wasn't optimizing his content for that platform for Instagram and the vertical video, or he was committing the ultimate sin for Instagram and taking video that was created for YouTube and uploading it directly to Instagram. Those are the two options. And if you're making content for a platform, let this be a note. If you're making content for a platform, make sure to optimize it for that platform so people have the best viewing experience on that platform. That is very, very important to do. And if you're not doing that, you are going to get hate and pushback like this archery guy got from you. And I I, I understand why you would do that. That would be maddening because you need to be able to see, I'm assuming, his form as well as what he's shooting at so you can actually gain information from that lesson. So Anthony, by the way, anybody who's watching and is into archery, he hosts a podcast, The Off Center Archers. Go check that out. Thank you for that. And the last comment comes from Maria. She says, nobody cares about you? In a sense, like family, one could be wrong. But in general, you are wrong. People care about some streamers and YouTube or whatever, I'm sure. I know a YouTube gamer whose most faithful followers worry about him and other things of him and that and pay every month for subscriptions. So reconsider it. It's a similar situation with famous people. So Maria, I understand what you're saying. 
I will go ahead and clarify what I meant last week. So when I said no one cares about you, I was talking about in the context of the current trend to overshare information on social media platforms. So I don't care how famous somebody is. I don't care how popular somebody is. I don't care how many followers somebody has. You shouldn't be sharing stuff like, oh, just had a cup of coffee. Oh, just had a donut. Oh, I just went to see this movie. Oh, I just went ahead and went to the dentist. I had to get a filling because nobody really cares. Now, what I mean by that is I do agree people care about each other. I'm not going to deny that. That is true. Your family cares about you. The people who watch you do sometimes care about you. And your friends care about you. That is 100% true. But would you ever call your family or a friend and say, Hey, Mom, I just had a donut. Bye. Probably not. And that's because even your mother wouldn't care. Hey, Mom, I just had a coffee. Bye. They don't care. So why are you sharing that with thousands of people? So just to clarify or, or sum up, I was saying nobody cares about you in the context of people oversharing really mundane, really stupid stuff or really personal stuff because people tend to overshare dumb, monotonous, uh, very mundane things or they overshare and say way too much about their relationships, about their location and not really taking into consideration that anybody can see that, even the creepy people. So I was saying that to kind of motivate people to stop oversharing. So I hope that cleared it up and I hope you weren't didn't think I meant that nobody actually cares about you because that's far from the truth. Now let's go ahead and get to my favorite part of the podcast, the Ask Bandrew segment. Okay, guys, so if you got any questions, go ahead and send them to askbandrew at gmail.com, and I may answer them on an upcoming episode of the podcast. We got a bunch of good emails this week. The first one comes from Vixie. From the Discord server, Vixie, thank you for sending this in. He asks a difficult question. He says, would you rather own an RE20 colored SM7B or an SM7B colored RE20? Then in uh, colons, he put blob thinking, which is, God, I hate the blobs so much. It's like a plague on the Discord server. So to answer your question, an RE20 colored SM7B. And let me go ahead and explain. I'm not one of those people who pick a microphone based on looks. I'm going to pick a microphone that I think sounds the best for what I'm using it for, and I really couldn't care about how it actually looks. So I'm a firm believer in function over form rather than form over function. So that's my take, an RE20 colored SM7B, because I don't care what it looks like. I still think it's an amazing sounding microphone. And for that note, the RE20 is also an amazing sounding microphone. It's just personal preference. But for me, I'm sure a lot of people, if they saw uh, an SM7B colored RE20, they would jump on that so, so fast. And and you know what? I would too. If I had the option between the current RE20 colored RE20 or a black SM7B colored RE20, I would go with the the black RE20 100% of the time. But that's not the case, so I, I, I'm not going down that road. I, I want the SM7B. So thank you for the question, Vixie. The second email comes from Ali. He says, hi, Bandrew. I've been following many YouTube content creators in various areas. At different points, some of them decided to resign from their daytime job to become a full-time YouTuber to live on YouTube, sponsor, Patreon income only. Among those, some are very satisfied. Many are happy. Unfortunately, a few of them regret their decisions. What are your thoughts on this topic? If the income was satisfactory, would you like to become a full-time YouTube content creator? You have mentioned that you are currently doing YouTube as a hobby. Would you have enjoyed doing YouTube videos if it was your main job? Thank you very much for your audio equipment review videos and for your podcast. So Ali, oh my God, coming with the heat. Amazing questions there, man. So first, my thoughts. I do 100% understand the desire to quit your day job to do YouTube full time. You're essentially becoming your own boss. That is most people's dream. Be your own boss. You don't have that jerk telling what you what to do at work anymore. That's amazing. You get to do what you love, assuming that you, you didn't just start YouTube to get famous. You started YouTube because you wanted to talk about what you enjoy and you're free to do whatever you want. You can say, you know what? I'm not going to upload today. I'm going to go ahead and go to the beach. You can do any of that stuff. It's a dream come true. It's a dream come true. Being your own boss, making YouTube content, it's in, it sounds incredible. So personally, I would love to be a full-time YouTuber, a tech personality, a micro-viewer, a podcaster, whatever the heck I would be labeled. I would love to. 
But one factor that would weigh heavily in my decision is health insurance. I know that's not a sexy answer, but I am very risk averse. I am very, very risk averse and health insurance is confusing to me and it is very volatile in the United States right now. And I believe it would be very, very expensive if you had to pay out of pocket pocket as an individual. So getting insurance through your employer is a much better route to go because you're able to pay significantly less and get significantly better benefits than if you were an individual. And that's because the company or your employer is going to pay a portion of the premium. And I believe that the, that your employer is also going to get a discounted rate for having a large pool of employees that they are insuring. So it's like a, a bulk discount, I guess. But I think what I could do on this channel if I did do it full time and didn't have a day job and uh, it, I, I would love that so much. It would be so much fun. The first thing is I'd probably take a vacation, though, because I've been working full time for seven years, maybe. And I don't think I've had an actual vacation other than maybe taking a day or two off where on those days I end up working on a podcast or working on YouTube. So I'm really not taking any time off on my weekends. I work on YouTube and my podcast the entire time. I do voice chats. Now I'm streaming. I, I have zero free time. So if I was doing this full time and I had the income, first thing I would do, maybe take a week or two vacation because I'm coming up on a decade with no actual vacation and it is maddening. So to answer your question, I would love to be a full time YouTuber, tech personality, podcaster, whatever the heck it is. But you know what? I, I'm very... I'm very aware of the risks that come along with that, the fluctuation and the volatility in your income stream, as well as health insurance. I don't want to be without health insurance. I don't want to do that because if I get sick, I, I may have to declare bankruptcy. Then I'm stuck working a day job for the rest of my life. You got to be really smart about your moves to become a full-time YouTuber or whatever, because it, it only takes one sickness to put you in the doghouse, to put you in the bankruptcy house. Or I guess the lack of a bankruptcy house. So <laughs> thank you very much for the question, Ali. That was a great one. We got another email from a different Ali. He says, Dear Bandrew, I just wanted to ask you a few questions. What are your thoughts on Android phones in general? Can condenser microphones break if you play drums too loudly? And what what are your thoughts on mechanical keyboards? And I am assuming that you are not earning much money from podcasting, but do you ever want to earn money from podcasting? Thanks. So first up, thoughts on Android. I personally tried Android for a few weeks and I just wasn't terribly impressed coming from iOS. I, I don't care about super deep customization. I don't care about that. I just want the phone to work. But maybe with a BlackBerry key too, I'll go ahead and give it another go. I have heard also many people say that iOS is just significantly more secure than Android. And I know I know in the comments, I'm going to have everybody who disagrees pointing out why I'm an idiot, how I'm wrong, and I welcome that, and I look forward to reading your, your explanation about why Android is more secure than iOS. But for me personally, it just didn't scratch any itch that I had. I didn't get anything out of it that I wasn't getting out of iOS. So I, I came into the iOS ecosystem, and I like it. So I see no real reason to change because I still really like iPhone or, or Apple hardware, the only thing that would make me consider switching is the hardware for Android, like the BlackBerry Key 2, which is seriously making me consider giving it a shot. So uh, there you go. Uh, number two, can condenser microphones break from high SPL or really loud drums? To my knowledge, no. Loud drums will not damage a condenser microphone. That's my take on it. Now, I think what's possibly happening would be the, the microphone is distorting, but that's the amplifier in the microphone, and it's not the actual capsule being damaged. Ribbon microphones, on the other hand, if there's a big burst of air, that could dislodge the ribbon and, yeah, damage or, or destroy the ribbon microphone, so you need to be more careful there. And I'll actually go ahead and link in the show notes and description where I was reading about this. It's a blog from Sure, where the, the first myth that they bust is talking about high SPLs damaging condenser microphones. So if you're interested in hearing it from the masters, there you go. Number three, thoughts on mechanical keyboards. I have the DOS keyboard with Cherry MX Blues, as I'm sure most of you are aware of because I mention it in every dang review video. And I also, excuse me as I went off microphone, I got the Corsair K63 wireless, which has more linear switches. So there's not as much clickiness. And to be honest, 
I love both of them. I love how they type. I don't really care how they sound. They just feel good to type on. I have no problems with them. I, I have, but you know what? I'm easy to please. I also really like the MacBooks keyboard. That's right, the one with the butterfly switches. I don't mind that. I also like the iPad Pro's keyboard. I think it works perfectly fine. I, I don't hate that either. So I'm easy to please. So you know what? I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm not a keyboard snob like the folks over at Linus Tech Tips are. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what his name is, the, the secondary guy. Uh, number four, do you ever want to make money from podcasting? Uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind. That, that came across really sleazy. <laughs> let, let me explain. I wouldn't argue if the opportun op opportunity, 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 See, when I start podcasting really long, my mind starts to go and my ability to speak properly <laughs> decreases. Opportunity. God. <laughs> I'm losing it. I'm losing my mind. If the opportunity arose to make money from podcasting, I wouldn't turn it down as long as the advertiser had zero say in the content of my podcast and they weren't requesting a five-minute segment up top talking about it. If they said, okay, do a 30-second ad, I'd be more than happy to do that, especially if it was from a service that I use or, or service that I believe in like PIA or, or 1Password or LastPass or ProtonMail or any of these privacy-focused services or, or heck, even Librem, not Librem, Purism. If Purism wanted to, to sponsor my podcast or my YouTube channel, I would be 100% happy to do that. Because I think it's really important to be private, private and secure. And a lot of people just say, oh, you know what? It's no big deal. So if I believed in the company, if I believed in the service and I used it 100%, I would make money. And if they, if they wanted to pay me to talk about it, absolutely happy to take their money and use it to go deeper down the rabbit hole into privacy. Wow, we went pretty long today. We're gonna wrap it up there. Reminder, if you got any questions that you want to ask, go ahead and send them to askbandrew at gmail.com and I may answer them on an upcoming episode of the podcast. Uh, Blackberry guys, uh, I'm so torn on that. Really wanna do that, so I'm gonna wrap it up there. I'll talk to you all next week. Thank you guys for watching and listening. See ya, bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production, your executive producer of Vandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.